welcome to the Labrador podcast from Tales of Success Labrador Training. Hi everyone, I'm back today to catch up on the progress of a dog that featured all the way back in episode 10 of our podcast, and that was around about a year ago. Back in that episode, I spoke with Sam Raggett about her young Labrador called Dennis. And back then, Dennis had just been diagnosed with elbow dysplasia. And we spoke about the journey from diagnosis right the way through to that long road to recovery. That journey covered the process of getting the diagnosis, an operation, hydrotherapy, physio, laser therapy, and also the long-term management of the condition. So if you've not already heard Dennis's story, I'm going to recommend that you head back to episode 10 and give that a little listen first. But today I'm joined by Dennis's other human. We've got George Raggett chatting with us today about the progress that Dennis has sort of achieved in the last 12 months. Hello, George. Thank you so much for joining us today to chat all about young Dennis. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Not bad, not bad at all. Um, we're talking about my favourite subject, Labrador, so I can't grumble at all. Um, mm -hmm. About a year ago, I chatted to Sam in that last episode, and I joked to her about the fact that I thought she'd probably have another Labrador puppy in her life before too long. Um, but you guys have actually just taken it one step further. You've gone and got yourself two new Labradors in the last year. So I want to start off by um, hearing about your your Labrador gang so tell us who you've got. Okay so we've got our original lab Mabel she's the uh, the one that starts all of this and then obviously Dennis and then we got Betty back in June of last year and everything was great we had three labs you know getting on really well and then just by chance really we we found another litter, which was a lovely little chocolate lab who we kind of, we, we had to take him home with us. So that made the uh, total up to four and that's little Percy, who's not so little anymore. But um, so yes, four Labradors, Mabel, Dennis, Betty and Percy. And um, you liked Labrador so much, you did literally go and get one in every colour. So you've got a yellow, a red, a black and a chocolate in that order isn't it so yes Mabel's the yellow Dennis the red Betty the black and Percy the chocolate yeah cool yeah and um, I wouldn't have it any other way <laughs> <laughs> and, and you've got these four Labradors and actually they're all young Labradors as well so Mabel is your eldest she's three and yeah. Percy is the youngest who's nine months old and there's a lot of people will be listening to this with one puppy under two years old thinking how the heck is someone managing for is it an absolute dream day today or are you kind of having any secret regrets um the reality of it is it's not a dream every day certainly isn't um having two puppies under the age of one has certainly come with its challenges um i think luckily with dennis because of his condition he was quite a mellow chilled out dog anyway um but Betty and Percy, on the other hand, have been very active as puppies. Um, we were kind of crazy getting two puppies at the same time, but we just felt that we wanted to get the puppy stage out of the way and done with, because truth be told, I'm not a huge fan of the puppy stage. I like them when, <laughs> when they're a bit from like 18 months onwards. So I just thought we'd just get the two puppies, get the puppy stage out of the way and done with, and then probably enjoy having four laps together yeah I love it so you're not a massive fan of the puppy stage so you got these puppies and then you went and broke your leg didn't you so you were kind of laid up um almost forcing the rest of the family to take care of the puppies at that point was um was that a bit of a challenge with your your broken leg at the same time yes yeah, certainly I mean breaking my leg and not being able to walk for three plus months brings its challenges when you've got when you're led on the sofa, everybody's at work and you've got four dogs around you that one's entertaining and things. So I had to be kind of quite creative with what I did to keep them entertained, you know, lots of enrichment activities and playing fetch from the sofa, which is quite a fun game. But when you've got four dogs, I get all excited. It get, gets a bit out of control sometimes. So Yeah, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about um, all four of them, their characters and and probably where they're at their happiest as well are they are they outdoor dogs is that where they 
like to be running around fields and that kind of stuff? Yeah, certainly. So the girls, Mabel and Betty, they're pretty much inseparable when we take them out for walks together. They find a lake or a river, they're literally straight in there every time. And they they just absolutely love just being out in the fields and running around together and sniffing and finding fox poo is always a favourite of theirs. Um, and then Dennis and Percy, they're, they're pretty similar to be fair, but um, I find when I'm taking the dogs out, it's really a lot more manageable taking two dogs out at a time. Uh, on the very rare occasion, I do take all four out together, but realistically, I need to be able to manage the dogs, keep an eye on them and be responsible with them really. So, so yeah, two dogs at a time, it's definitely, mm. definitely the way forward. I, I'm intrigued to know, because I know Mabel and Dennis were kind of your original pair, but you went and got two other dogs. Was it always going to be Labradors? Did you even consider any other breeds? No, it's always <laughs> going to be Labradors. And if by some by some chance we get any more in the future, then yeah, it would just be Labradors. Has to be. We're very biased, but yeah, they're the best. They're the absolute best. So um, always Labradors. Um, what would you say is the best thing about having a Labrador in your life? Um, I think they've taught me so much about myself and, you know, how to be a good dog owner because having one dog, you kind of, you, you learn a bit and you kind of, you think, you know, just kind of walking my dog and training my dog and everything like that. But when you start getting into multiples of dogs, it, really kind of changes everything especially what we've been through with Dennis um you know you kind of learn about all the health issues and what to look out for with a good dog and things like that so when we were picking Betty and Percy we were going through breeders with fine tooth comb you know checking everything like health scoring um eye tests DNA tests the lot you know we we really kind of went yeah just really kind of looked through everything we possibly could um, and I guess that's to try and to try as best as you can to avoid that kind of displace your type thing happening with the the new pups is that right yeah yeah certainly so you know we we would only buy dogs from fully health tested parents on the point of displacia so there will be people listening to this that have kind of not heard of it or heard of it but don't really know what it is so in very basic broad strokes terms what is elbow dysplasia what does it mean to you so to us elbow dysplasia is a genetic condition which is a deformity in the elbow joint um, that the dog has from birth so in Dennis's case he had his bone joint didn't quite form properly so the elbow joint's made up of three very complicated bone structures that all need to fit perfectly together um, and in Dennis's cases in Dennis's case um, they weren't kind of fitting together quite well and there was a few bits where the bones hadn't actually attached onto each other so what Dennis had was some floating bone fragments within the joint which is kind of comparable to having a stone in your shoe you imagine walking around and you've got a stone in your shoe you what do you do you take your shoe off take the stone out and carry on and everything's fine but in Dennis's case this stone was inside of his joint and he couldn't do anything which is what kind of caused the limp um, with his condition it's just because you know it's highly irritating and not very comfortable for him at all um, and also the cartilage in his joint so his cartilage was diseased from the dysplasia and normally the cartilage in a joint it's kind of like a kind of soft spongy texture kind of that will cushion the joint but in Dennis's case it was kind of very fluid kind of liquid state almost which wasn't really given any kind of cushioning for the joint which again you know added to the discomfort that he was going through. Yes it's, it's really tough that um such a difficult thing for a young dog to to grow up with and actually in the last episode we heard about some of the the processes that you've gone through with surgery and you've then gone on to things like hydrotherapy laser therapy and a few other bits and pieces 
But Sam did mention to us on that last um, episode that he was due to start labrella injections. I think that was kind of the next thing that he was going to have. So did that go ahead? And did you see any effect from labrella? Yeah, so labrella is a relatively new drug. Um, and what it does compared to the your normal anti-inflammatory drugs, so your loxicon, your metacam, things like that, the labrella actually blocks the pain receptors in the joint. So essentially it's telling the dog, you've got no pain at all in your joint. Um, and compared to loxicom, so loxicom, for example, you have to have um, a syringe of that once, twice a day. So it's a daily kind of medication you need. It's, you know, it's, you have to remember to take it all the time and it, it's a lot of hassle, but compared to Labrella, that was just a monthly injection. Um, and for Dennis, it it worked absolute wonders. So within, I think it's 24 hours. I mean, before Dennis had the Labrella injection, he was limping and hobbling around. 24 hours later, after the injection, and he was just walking like a normal dog. Obviously, did you, know, did you notice that that kind of pain relief that he was feeling lasted for, for the whole month? Or did you start to notice that it, it wears off a little bit? And the reason I ask that is I've used Labrella with my golden oldies that have got arthritic hips. And it was almost kind of at the three, three and a half week point. It was almost like this overnight switch where probably it had worn off to a significant degree where they were starting to struggle again. It was it was very obvious when that was wearing off. Did you notice the same with Dennis? Yeah, exactly that. So around the three to four week mark, it would kind of start to wear off and the limp would gradually come back again. Um, so, you know, we just get ourselves booked in for another Librella injection. But we did find that after about three or four months of having these injections, that because Dennis was able to build up his muscle strength in his legs, because of, because of not being in pain and having to compensate with the other leg with a limp and everything because he was able to walk normally and increase that muscle strength he was actually able to go for longer between liberal injections so by the end of it we were going maybe six seven weeks even between liberal injections which was you know absolutely brilliant news you know kind of music to our ears really so so yeah it really did help to kind of build up his strength and, and, and that's great news for Dennis but it's also really good news for your your bank balance and your wallet because it's I think with Labrella it is a it's a monthly commitment isn't it once you start yeah. it's it's beneficial to keep going with that until you know another solution potentially comes along yeah um and one of those other solutions that maybe you have found um is stem cell treatment so again for people listening to this that know nothing about stem cell treatment what is it Okay, so stem cell therapy, it's considered a breakthrough treatment because it's literally 100% natural. So it uses the body's own healing properties to treat the source of the problem, not just the symptoms. So all your non, non steroidal anti inflammatories, your labrella, that's literally just treating the symptoms. But stem cells actually treat the problem at the source. So what they do, in Dennis's case, they make a small incision on the stomach, um, remove a bit of fat, and then they isolate the cells from that and then activate them into the stem cells. Not really 100% sure on the science, but <laughs> they activate them and then inject them into the areas damaged by the arthritis. Um, and what this does is it initiates and accelerates the tendon and ligament and cartilage repair. So obviously in Dennis's case, where he had the damaged cartilage, the stem cells were kind of working their magic inside his body and repairing repairing the joints essentially and healing it and kind of so making is, it. Is, it, is it almost kind of like encouraging the dog's natural body to start healing itself? Yeah, exactly that. So in the damaged joint with the damaged cartilage and, you know, arthritic bones and stuff, the body's natural defense is to kind of attack it with all these white blood cells and you know kind of trying to heal itself but in the process it's kind of going into overdrive stem cell therapy 
what it does is it kind of creates a nicer environment in the joint for the body. So it kind of just resets everything, puts new cells in there, kind of tells the body, be like, hang on, this is a good joint. We're going to do some good stuff here and let's repair things and just reset things and get things back to normal. And that's exactly what it did to Dennis. So how did you stumble across stem cell treatment? Is it something your vet recommended? Uh, so this was recommended to us by Izzy, our hydrotherapist. Um, and it was also mentioned to us initially when Dennis had his arthroscopy um, by the vet, but it wasn't something that they did, but they did suggest that he would be a good candidate for it. But at the time we were managing things with libretto and, you know, we just thought we'd carry on that way. But um, once we took the advice from our hydrotherapist, we kind of asked them the questions and they got us in for a chat and a few x-rays and whatnot. And yeah, the rest, rest is history. So what was the uh, procedure for that? So you turn up at your stem cell treatment location, wherever that might be. What, what do they do with Dennis? How long does it take? And is it multiple courses that you need to do or is it just a one-off? Okay, so um, when we first went there, the the first visit is where that's where they harvest the cells. So they make the incision in Dennis, take the fat cells out to harvest the stem cells. Um, at the same time, he also had some platelet rich plasma injected into his joints. Um, and this again is another natural treatment where they take some blood, I think it's from the neck they did it, and then they separate the plasma from the blood and then inject that into the joint. And that again is a natural anti-inflammatory, which probably lasts about up to a year. Um, so yeah, the yeah, the first visit is getting the stem cells extracted and harvested. And then what we do, we have to wait four weeks for the cells to kind of generate. And I think they made something like 100 million plus stem cells um, to put back into the body. And then once those four weeks have passed, we go back again for a second visit. Um, this one's a lot less invasive. So it's literally just injections into the joints. Um, and then, yeah, we took our dentist home. Wow. So on that first visit where they kind of um, d do the first bit, I take it Dennis was, um, he was knocked out for that procedure, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So they... Um, Use sedative with Dennis um, so they could take x-rays um, and take all the stem cells out and everything like that. Um, and his recovery but, from that initial visit, was there anything longer term that affected him from that procedure? Or did he just seem to get a little bit better once the stem cell treatment was working? Um, to kind of give him any special care and treatment after that visit? Um, so we had a, a little bit of special treatment because discovered that he has an allergic reaction to penicillin. So when he came out of the uh, surgery, he had a big puffy face and big puffy eyes and everything. Um, and also he had an injection of Librello at the time of having the stem cells. So, you know, kind of because the Librello works so well with Dennis, he didn't really need too much kind of care and attention. It was pretty much, I'd say, 24, 48 hours later, back to being a normal dog again. Good, great stuff. And um, is this something then that he's going to have to have done frequently, so the stem cell treatment, or do we yeah. see that actually just a couple of times and then we don't need to go back? Yeah, so the stem cells that Dennis has had, they last approximately two to three years, and then he will have to have some more stem cells injected again but luckily with the first treatments, they save some of the stem cells that they've harvested, put them on ice for you so that when you go back for a second visit in two to three years time, it will just be a case of turn up for Dennis, injection into the joints, and then he's good again for another two to three years. Excellent. But fingers crossed that it worked as well as the Labrella did, and maybe we could get four years if we're lucky. <laughs> yeah, and I know when, when I spoke to Sam, she mentioned that this was not a condition that we make better. We don't get rid of it, but actually we need to manage it over the course of the dog's life. And I think from the Labrella and the stem cell treatment, it sounds, it sounds pretty positive. Are you feeling that he's doing quite well on those two treatments, or do you still see days where he's really, really struggling? Um, 
No. I mean, if you saw Dennis running in a field or walking in the street, you wouldn't even be able to tell that he had his outbit displays here. I mean, it is literally, it's, it's incredible. It's like a, a miracle treatment of what it has done for him. I mean, I've, I've had him out running with the other dogs with Mabel. and I mean, Mabel's quick, but Dennis has actually proved that he's quicker than Mabel, even with having the dysplasia and the, you know, the, the do dodgy joints, so to speak. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just absolutely, absolutely fascinating, the medical advances and what, what it's been able to do for Dennis. It really is incredible what, what can be done with the right help and support, but not everything's rosy. So I know you've had some setbacks um, specifically around um, arthritis with, with Dennis. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So when Dennis um, went for the stem cell treatment, they did some x-rays with him just to get a more up-to-date picture of how his joints are doing and what they're looking like. And Dennis has only recently just turned two, but he's already quite severely arthritic, um, which was a bit of a shock to us, really, because we knew we knew he would get arthritis, but we didn't realise kind of how bad it would be so soon. Um, but even though he's so arthritic already, um, it's, it's still amazing how kind of strong and, yeah, just how strong he really is because... You know, he just doesn't show any signs or symptoms between the labrella, which I might just add that he hasn't had any pain relief since his stem cell treatment. Wow. So does that um, include labrella? That includes labrella wow. or metacam or anything like that. So, yeah, he had the stem cell treatment back in November and yeah, no pain relief whatsoever. You said something to me um in some notes that you sent me and I'll just read them out. You said he really shouldn't be able to walk like he is. He is our miracle dog. Um, and I think he is, isn't he? You know, he, he's kind of surprised you with how much he's taken on for such a young dog. It's, it's absolutely incredible at seeing him run around a field. Cause I guess a year or two ago, you probably didn't think that would be the case. Yeah, certainly. I mean, when we look back at the videos of Dennis, when he's like eight, nine months old and, limping around we thought we'd never be able to take him up the hill or take him down to the lakes or anything like that and now when you see him just running about as if he's a completely normal dog you know it it really just does amaze you and um when i sent the recent x-rays to our hydrotherapist to have a look at she kind of looked at him and it's as a medical professional when you look at these x-rays you think well that dog that dog's going to be limping, it's going to be hobbling around, it's going to be really res restricted and, you know, kind of restricted movement. But actually the range of movement in Dennis's joints is, I think it's only about 10 degrees off what a normal fit and healthy Labrador should be. So, wow. you know, it's, it's brilliant. And obviously having the regular hydrotherapy sessions um, really does help. And you mentioned earlier about Dennis having the laser therapy treatment. Um, he's even stopped having that now. So it is literally just hydrotherapy sessions and walks in good times. Brilliant. And what's the future look like for him now? So do we expect him to live a normal, if we can say normal, sort of a normal life of a, a young dog for the rest of his days? Have we got any anything else in the pipeline? What What's the future looking like? Um, to be honest, I think, I think the future's looking bright for Dennis. Um, there's no reason why he can't carry on living to a good old age, um, especially if he carries on having the stem cell treatment throughout his life. That should, in theory, trick his body into thinking that there's nothing wrong with the elbow joint. Um, I'd imagine by the time he gets kind of to nine, ten years old, we might start to see the effects more of the arthritis. Um, but it all depends on Dennis, really. I mean, he's already he's already proved us wrong on so many occasions of what we kind of expected from him that, you know, we just have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, he's he's a determined boy. So, you know, fingers crossed, you know, he carries on bouncing around like he is doing. Yeah. Um, 
you mentioned at the very beginning about when you got your two newest puppies about making sure that they'd got their proper testing in place and, and getting them from good reputable breeders do we think we could have avoided this situation with Dennis if the breeders had maybe done their homework a little bit more and done the testing that they should have done um absolutely I mean for Dennis to be born with the severity of displacement in his joints um having the correct hip and elbow scores would have absolutely you know picked something up I'm I'm sure of it because whilst the stud of Dennis's litter was excellent across the board and good scores and DNA and everything um mum didn't actually have any hip or elbow scores done so I'm pretty sure if she had uh elbow scores done it would it would certainly come up come up with a scoring on there that, that wouldn't be too favorable for any puppies in the future yeah. so it's so so important to have that testing done just to get peace of mind and of course we can never rule out things we can't say every puppy is going to be perfect if they've got good good scores but mm. it does make you wonder how many poor puppies have been brought into this world from um, parents that maybe shouldn't be used for breeding um, for this very reason so if you've got anyone else listening to this that's thinking about buying a puppy what advice would you give to them when they're going to look at the puppies and speaking with the breeders about what tests have been done what would you say to them um don't be afraid to ask questions doesn't matter how ridiculous you think the question is just ask them if it's a responsible breeder then they will answer the question and provide any proof that you need, any paperwork, anything like that. And don't be afraid to walk away from a litter. So most people I know, they'll go see a litter of puppies and you can pretty much guarantee that they're gonna come home and go, yeah, we're gonna get a puppy, we're gonna get a puppy. But when we were looking for Betty, for example, we walked away from three different litters before we actually picked Betty. And that was purely because there was one thing or another that didn't quite sit right with us. Um, but when we picked Betty, she came from a Kennel Club Assure breeder. She had all the testing, all the health checks, you know, just just a great all round good litter. So, yeah, just just don't be afraid to say no and ask any question you could possibly think of. Yeah, be be the person that kind of pesters the breeder, and actually, I think a reputable reputable breeder that wants to make sure their puppies are going to the right homes would probably welcome that anyway. They want a potential buyer to to be invested in that puppy's future. So yeah, ask as many questions as you can. Yeah, um, certainly, because I mean, the, a good breeder will also ask questions about yourself as well. Um, when we brought Percy, the breeder said to us that they'd actually stalked our Instagram before we came to visit, you know, just to kind of get a picture of what we're like with dog owners, you know, being dog owners and things like that. So when they saw we already had three Labradors and we come to buy a fourth one that, um, you know, might be a little bit crazy, but we also might actually be doing an okay job at this. Yeah, Labradors. definitely. Yeah. And I, I would definitely say you're doing a very good job of it. Um, thinking back about Dennis's, um, displacia journey that he's had do you think you might have done anything differently with the benefit of hindsight and knowing what you know now so I guess we could say should you have done anything differently or if one of your other dogs got displacia might you do something maybe in a different order um, or avoid doing certain things uh, yes so I would have definitely got a second opinion and um, from another vet and specifically an orthopedic specialist um, just because our first vet, who we're no longer with, um, they actually initially said to us that Dennis had growing pains and said, don't worry, it'll be fine. And then obviously we went to see another vet. And they were like, right, we'll get the x-ray and then do the CT scan because to them it was quite obvious what it was. Um, and also I think we would miss out a lot of the pain relief options that we used. So things like the... Metacamaloxicon, because sometimes that can have complications with the digestive system with a dog. Um, you know, it can, can cause a bit of damage through long-term use. So I think we would probably just do, do the arthroscopy straight to stem cells and then Librella 
if needed in the future. Um, and you mentioned about kind of getting second opinions. I know from looking at Instagram stuff, there's a lot of dog owners out there that almost have a little niggle in the back of their mind that makes them think there's something not quite as it should be with my dog. If there's people thinking that and they've been to their vet and they've been told, you know, go home, don't worry. Would you kind of say, you know, knock on a different vet's door straight away? Would you give them any other advice? Um, I mean you do have to trust your vet up to a certain point because at the end of the day they are the medical professional not yourself i mean you can quite easily look on google and you know diagnose your dog with all sorts of problems but the vets are the one that know what they're talking about but if you see an issue with your dog and it doesn't seem to go away or it's persistent um even two, three months later. And yeah, just don't be afraid to go see another vet. Um, they're not going to be offended at the end of the day because you're still paying for the visit. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just getting about that second opinion. And, you know, what one vet might think is one thing, another vet might have a better, better insight on it. Yeah. Um, another thing I want to ask about Dennis and his recovery. So I know during the early stages, he had to have quite a bit of crate rest or kind of forced rest where he couldn't have his his walks. Again, if we've got any listeners that are going through a similar thing where their dog is kind of on this forced rest, what was your biggest wins as far as keeping a young, energetic dog entertained when you couldn't let them go and run around the field like he wanted to? Yeah, so... That is a really difficult thing because even just maybe two, three weeks before Dennis's operation, he wasn't enjoying being in the crates. He was, you know, we tried leaving him in the crates and be barking and whinging and crying and things like that. So we just had to really make it a positive environment and a nice place for him to be in. So we got a good comfy mattress bed in there for him. Um, always treated him with food in there. We'd let him have licky mats in there or a con, um, even sometimes eating his dinner in there just to associate with it being a good place and normally associated with food because that always seems to work with Labradors. Um, and yeah, just showing him that it's a good, safe environment for him to be in and to be in for long periods of time because certainly after the operation, I think it's maybe six weeks of great rest with only short five minute walks during the day. So they really have to get used to being in that crate. Yeah. It's a very, very tough time for, for kind of all involved really, you know, now he's come out of that. Is he being a great big brother to your youngest two, or is he um, still leading them astray? <laughs> uh, no, he's really good actually. Um, Dennis and Mabel, because they're that bit more mature now, um, you know, they're kind of really great role models for the other two. Dennis will certainly put Percy in his place when he's trying to kind of take a toy off him or something like that. But he'll do it in a in a in a nice way, you know. They're they're not nasty dogs with each other. They're just 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 a nice friendly pack. And you know, it's it's just an absolute pleasure to have four Labradors definitely you know three years ago when you brought Mabel into your family mm. did you ever think in the future you would have four um I always knew I'd have multiple dogs did, did Sam know you would have multiple dogs was this a joint plan <laughs> yeah. or your plan <laughs> uh no joint plan I think but we didn't actually tell each other so <laughs> <laughs> it kind of just naturally happened um and yeah, yeah, just four dogs. Four dogs seems a good number now. Yeah, and they, they do bring so much joy, fun. You know, they totally change people's lives. They're, they're absolutely amazing creatures. But we've got to show balance. Tell us about the really frustrating parts of having four dogs in your house. Um, if you like sleep, do not get four Labradors or even two or even one, in fact. Just, just don't get a dog, you know, because early morning starts they happen every day I mean the older dogs they're not so bad they will sleep in till seven eight o'clock but Percy and Betty seem to take it in turns at the moment to want to wake up at 
between quarter to six and six o'clock in the morning, which is lovely on your day off when you just want to have a bit of a lie in, but you've got a dog that wants their breakfast. And then once one dog wants their breakfast, all four dogs want their breakfast. So yeah, <laughs> don't don't expect any sleep. <laughs> Um, now people have heard a little bit about your four dogs and also the dysplasia issue because you're quite open about this on on their Instagram account so give a little shout out to uh, the four dogs Instagram account so people can follow you and also reach out to you if they want to. Yeah so it's Mabel underscore and underscore Dennis and yeah I mean anybody can message us on there about dysplasia. Um, We regularly have you know, people contact us saying, are their dogs going through the same thing or through the diagnosis and things like that. So, you know, we're, we're always happy to help anybody out, you know, because we had people help us when we were at the early stages. So it's just nice to be able to return that favour to other people in the community. George, so when people have used different services, we do like to give them the opportunity to share that almost as a recommendation. Now, I have no idea what you're going to say to this question, but... Who is it that you trust to do your stem cell treatment? And who is it that you've interested Dennis with hydrotherapy for? Give him a little shout out. Um, so, yeah, it was Stem Cell Vet. Um, the website stemcellvet.co.uk. Uh, they were the ones that did this miracle treatment for Dennis. And they really have been fantastic. You know, the, the aftercare has been second to none. You know, receiving regular phone calls and everything like that from them just checking up on how Dennis is doing so yeah just really want to say a big thank you to them Um, and also to Izzy our hydrotherapist who's been with us pretty much from the beginning with the journey with Dennis he's been having hydrotherapy for around 18 months now and I think we'll continue doing it for a long long time with him too Um, so yeah that's at Cotswold Dog Spa and the team there are really 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 great so thank you awesome big shout out to them and everyone go check them out if it's something that interests you george thank you to you and to sam as well for sharing dennis's story with us um me and i'm sure the rest of the listeners do wish you the best of luck going ahead and maybe next time we chat there might be another labrador in your pack (laughs) we shall see Thanks for joining us. Find out more by checking out talesofsuccess.com or search at Tales Success on your social channels.